we are recording. So all, all the vascular cases and also with car cardiopulmonary bypass are going to involve using heparin protamine. So you'll see a lot of questions on the test talking about heparin and protamine. You know, heparin is the acid, protamine is, um, heparin is the acid, when they combine, and I think protamine is the, the base, and when they combine, they form a salt. So you can have allergies to both of these. We typically always think of people having allergies to protamine, and then there's risk factors for who's going to have those allergies. It's people who've been exposed to similar looking proteins. So, you know, anaphylaxis is usually seeing some type of antigen that you have antibodies to, and when you're allergic to it, there's an immune response. In this case, there's, I guess, some crossovers between patients that have had uh, vasectomies uh, from possibly from the proteins being kind of spilled from that procedure. Allergies to fish and then MPH, so if you have a history of taking MPH. So, no matter what you have for risk factors for allergies of protamine, you want to always just give it slow. Never give protamine more than 10 milligrams a minute. Um, and then as you give it on the first dose that you're giving, be, be cognizant of what the blood pressure is doing. Be cognizant of the symptoms you're going to see for allergic reactions. So when you have histamine release, you're going to see a drop in blood pressure. If they're able to, they'll mount an increase in tachycardia, increase in heart rate, in order to try and recover the loss in stroke volume because of massive vasodilation. The lungs are going to display changes as well, depending how bad the anaphylaxis is. You're going to see bronchoconstriction. So bronchoconstriction is going to decrease and narrow the airways, the conducting airways, uh, to the alveoli, and you'll see that on the ventilator as increase in uh, increase in peak inspiratory pressures. You'll sit, typically see, if you're looking at it more advanced and you're running plateau pressures, you'll see a bigger change between plateau pressures and peak pressures because it's not a problem with compliance, it's a problem with getting the air to the actual alveoli, and that's your conducting airways that are bronchoconstricting. And your treatment for this is going to be the same as it is whether you're eating peanut butter and you have an allergy or if you're allergic to another type of drug, you're going to treat it with epinephrine. And I always say this, and I've seen this in practice actually, and I underappreciated this until I saw it in practice, even though I've seen this with a friend of mine who's got severe anaphylaxis. If you go into anaphylaxis and you treat it with, let's say, you know, 10, 20, 30 mics of epi, and you're trying to figure out what's going on, the patient's on hemodynamically in, unstable, that's good for the here and now, but that's going to obviously stop working. You're going to run out of that. That epi dose is going to, you know, dilute it up, dilute itself out. It's not going to be effective long term. So you have to give something that's a little bit longer acting. And I saw this once in post-op with someone who's hemo hemodynamically unstable with hives. You can see hives too in your patient. Don't forget, you can always pull down their shirt, look at their chest area around their neck and see if they're having hives. It's another indication they might be having an allergic reaction. But the patient kept going back into like severe hypotension. So it was because we had only given IV doses of epinephrine and typically we give IM doses, right? When you think of ACLS. At the IM dose is obviously going to be able to give people a more stable plateau of epinephrine. Now, we don't have to give IM, but we could put people on very low dose epinephrine drips, and that's going to probably stabilize the histamine release from the mast cells and the basophils. As far as the fish allergy goes, the protamine is actually made from salmon sperm. So I guess that's the association there for, for why you would be able, why you might have an allergic reaction. Common drugs that we use, I listed two here. This was actually, this PowerPoint used to include uh, Nora and EP Lab, which Max did. So I left the slide because I think it's still somewhat relevant. The isoproteranol, maybe not so much. And the adenosine and stuff, um, but the cardiac tamponade, you know, is something that you should always keep in mind, especially with thoracic procedures. If they're in the thoracic area, you're going to have the mediastinum, the, the pericardium right there. And if they were to, you know, during the vascular procedure, go through the aorta, let's say, 
or on a thoracic approach or an open thoracic approach, they can always cause trauma and bleeding to the pericardium. So cardiac tamponade is still something to keep in the back of your mind. I think we'll see it, I don't know if we'll see it more often in EP lab, but I've seen it most often in EP lab having uh, someone go into tamponade. And hopefully you identify it early and you treat it, but you can have slow bleeds that can present an hour to two hours later. But hopefully you've scanned the patient under fluoro and you've assessed it. But tamponade is something to always keep in your back of your mind. So, and I think on the last test we had tamponade as one of the questions too. So you're looking at dampened arterial waveforms. Uh, you can see a narrowing pulse pressure. You'll see like decrease in amplitude of the ECG, pulseless paradoxus, you know, all this common things. You know, a pericardiosynthesis is uh, treatment. And then just remember when we're under these procedures, we're most likely giving heparin. So if there's excessive bleeding, uh, one of the considerations that should come up pretty early is when should we reverse the heparin? And Max, I think, talked about having really good communication because you have to have that discussion with everyone. You know, for you, it might be best to obviously reverse the heparin that's going to stop the bleeding, but depending on where they're at in a procedure, if they're on bypass, it could be catastrophic. So it's just a question to have with someone. Is it appropriate to give TXA but not reverse heparin? These are questions you should be talking to the uh, to whoever you're working with and then with the uh, surgeon that's doing the procedure. So there's reperfusion complications. So when you're doing some of these procedures, you may be clamping. So if you're clamping like an artery, you're not going to have any flow distally. And so the body's going to now go from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And you're going to start to pick up, build up a very heavy load of lactic acidosis, which is going to become a problem as soon as they revascularize. So some considerations for that is basically a clamp situation is going to be different than, let's say, a more regional area of like of, of decrease in blood flow, either because they've stopped blood flow or because they're going to have limits to blood flow because they're placing uh, catheters into vessels that are already synodic and now that's sharing space with their catheters and stuff. So the degree of acidotic burden is going to be different. And then the people, the people's response, the patient's response is obviously going to be I would say linear to the amount of acidotic load that they receive either after they revascularize or after they take a clamp off. But when it comes time for that reperfusion, that clamp dropping and stuff, some of the basic things that I do during every case is I always want to make sure there's 100% FiO2 on board ahead of time. They're going to get an enormous burden of, of CO2, lactic acidosis, and it's going to put an enormous strain on the heart. You know, acidosis can actually cause the uh, the heart to decrease its contractility. It stuns the heart. We see that with sepsis as well. Fluid's a good idea to get on board. Uh, you have to time it. If you give too much fluid in a case of like aortic clamping and stuff, depending on where the clamp is, the fluid's going to be. It could be not helpful because you might be putting too much burden on the heart before the clamp goes down because the preload is already high when you have a clamp on. And we have a slide on the clamp as well. But you want to be thinking about fluids. You want to be thinking about warm fluids because if you're going to give a lot of fluid to resuscitate this patient who's had, let's say, from the waist down, completely stopped from blood flow by clamping the aorta, they're going to need quite a bit of fluid. Fluid's also going to be helping with renal perfusion, uh, which is important because the renals are going to be not only dealing with increase acid as renals take care of they help as well as the lungs with controlling the acid base but they're going to be taxed now afterwards and they may have already been taxed during the case because the clamp may have been somewhere near the renal the, re, the renal arteries and may have inhibited or decreased uh, renal perfusion as a result of the procedure itself so what kind of solutions do you give plasma light a and or lactic ringers. There's a really good article, actually a series of articles on MCRIT on fluid resuscitation and the principles of fluid resuscitation. So talking about lactic ringers and plasma A and then some of the concerns with normal saline. You'll see 
there's always an I'll, I'll probably find people are 50 50 in, in clinical practice without I think citing articles on what's best practice as to do you give LR for instance with end-stage renal or do you give normal sodium and I'll leave that debate to you guys to figure out in your own respective clinical practices but normal saline when you give enough fluid has excessive amounts of uh, chloride in it um, and so you're talking about 154 milliequivalents and that's higher than what you normally have in the body and so although they consider it isotonic it's actually on the spectrum closer to something that's hypertonic and in the case of chloride chloride can contribute to acidosis so if you're already dealing with acidosis from non-chloride sources like lactic acid for instance and anaerobic metabolism you're only going to worsen the metabolic acidosis and the goal in general is always about hemodynamic stability and it's not just blood pressure but it's also ph you want to have a normal ph because all your enzymes depend on a normal ph in order to function and enzymes are key to the body surviving and, and functioning efficiently so when you do do these procedures if someone's in an extreme acidotic state after either during clamp time and let's re we'll refer to it as clamp time during clamp time or post clamp time it's going to only worsen that so it's going to take a lot more time to be able to recover the patient and it also increases their mortality and morbidity and when they get hit with that wave of acid let's say from an extremely being down this also occurs too with tourniquets it's really the same thing um, you might have to support the pressures so sometimes I'll just give phenylephrine in order to help su support the vasodilation associated with the acidosis if you need to and a couple boluses aren't getting your maps up to wh whatever your goal is for that procedure the blank answer is always going to be 20 percent of baseline in some of these cases it may need, may need to be higher than normal um, time to start in a vasoactive drip and these are a lot of cases where you might just do a vasoactive drip to start you should have one already hung and ready to go so peripheral vascular disease or occlusive disease is most often associated with atherosclerosis this stuff happens over time the plaque formation decreases flow so we think of decreasing radius so it starts to become very pressure dependent since the vessels can no longer in some cases auto regulate or vasodilate based on pressures um, so you're not able to compensate for flow so you have to increase your pressures to overcome that fixed defect this is the same thing in the legs as it is in the coronaries, even in the carotids. So we talked about clamping. This just describes, I guess, the clamping and unclamping. There's two important phases. These aren't times during cases when we're talking about aortic clamping that you go on break, that you leave, or that you're distracted talking to your preceptors. This is when you want to be fully focused on the procedure at hand and prepared for some of the sideway changes in hemodynamics that can happen not everyone's gonna respond uh, extremely to clamping and unclamping but some people are going to respond extremely so we want to be prepared for the extreme changes and then if they don't change extremely we're over prepared and we're happy but for the ones that go through extreme changes uh, we want to know what to do so extreme changes being pretty much you apply an air clamp and the patient go into severe heart failure and you might have to abort the procedure and then not so extreme changes are the clamp goes on there's minimal changes and we just manage and, and surveil abgs and whatever hemodynamic monitors that we're using for the case some concerns later clamping are going to come down to where the clamps place so the more distal the better the more proximal the worse it is and you can just imagine that when you think of like your vasculature and you think of having say parallel uh, systems to be able to take on the cardiac output the more vasculature places that you can send blood to the less resistance for the heart to pump to so you know when you have let's say both legs and your celiac artery your mesenteric artery systems your renals you have all those places to perfuse there's a lot of places to send every stroke volume, right? Every cardiac conduction, there's somewhere to send that. As you start to take away different components, a left leg, a right leg, or maybe like the vasculature to your stomach and stuff, now you have less places to send the blood, but your heart still has to send the blood somewhere. And so the heart now has to 
work against higher afterload. And it's that higher afterload, when we used to look at that graph with the afterload and the effect on like LV function, the function's gonna go down. Now, if you have someone with a heart, in a lot of cases, these patients all have really bad comorbidities that are heart and respiratory related. They may not be able to handle that extreme change in afterload. And you gotta remember, you know, even if the surgeon were to slowly clamp that aorta, I mean, what over two cycles, three cycles of the heart rate, I mean, it's still going to be very acute for the heart to all of a sudden now have to figure out what it's going to do. And the amount of extra, or the amount of places for it to send it to is, I guess, basically what's going to decide whether or not it's going to be able to tolerate that. The exception is, is with people who actually have really bad stenotic disease or really bad vasculature through the aortic defect that they're trying to fix, actually do a little bit better because they're already used to that afterload. So if you're closing an aortic, if you're closing the aorta above a defect that already has, and I'm just making this up, but has like 80% occlusion, what's the difference with that 20%? So those patients may have already sort of a, adjust it to the, to the afterload from long-term afterload increases from, let's say, atherosclerosis. But other patients that might not have as bad of a stenosis or a decrease in radius are going to respond more acutely and severely. So this is a challenge. So if you're going to place the clamp on and you're worried about afterload, if you give too much fluid before you clamp, you run the risk of increasing the effect of that stroke volume because now you have a higher stroke volume because you have higher preload and now that cardiac cycle is now going to be trying to put that stroke that extra stroke volume through more resistance and stuff and so it's going to compound the the risk for cardiac dysfunction before you clamp you also want to limit that effort ac across that increased afterload so you might want to increase the anesthetic in anticipation. It's consider that clamp like a massive bolus of phenylephrine. And what would you do in that case if someone gave too much phenylephrine? Um, so options could include increasing seugal If you have an epidural, you could titrate that. Um, you could also give something that's going to be fast acting that can work towards vasodilating. And I'm pretty sure we have more slides once we get to the ERIC surgery stuff. As far as unclamping goes, it's all the opposite. So you're getting prepared for that massive acidotic response or, or return to the heart. And you're going to have a significant decrease in preload because now your body can send its blood volume to the other one third, two thirds of the body, whatever it ends up being. And now the heart has to quickly, hopefully adjust to less preload because that blood's now filling up all those areas that were under perfused before while at the same time being sort of handicapped by the acidotic uh, load that's being returned to the heart. <coughs> so during like big cases, big aortic cases that are high up, you know, these are, these are patients that you might want to have a, an agent that can help not only with uh, vasoconstriction, but also with inotropy. This is a hemodynamic response graph for cross clamping that comes out of up to date. And they took this from, it looks like a, a book. The only thing I can take from it we didn't mention already, or just to make note of, is that if the heart can increase contractility because, again, stretching of the atrium because of increased preload, that's normally Frank Starling's law, right? Increased heart rate is also something that happens as you get more preload because you just clamped. Um, normally, the heart would just increase its uh, effort to get the get the excess preload out, right? It's going to increase its contractility. It's going to increase the stroke volume, the ejection of all the blood out because it wants to always keep up with what you're sending it. Um, if that happens and someone who has vascular disease also has coronary vascular disease, so we think just aorta, but we assume that the aorta's got bad atherosclerosis or aneurysms, that we're assuming that also they're carotid in their coronary. So, you know, can, those, can that person's coronaries compensate for that increase in workload? So you go back to that supply and demand graph where you're looking at the coronaries and you're saying, well, 
we're asking for three times the amount of blood through the coronaries because the heart's working really hard. But A, are we supplying it? And, um, and, and B, is there anything we can do to improve that? Um, so again, those coronaries could have fixed defects that don't respond well to low blood pressures. Although in this case, you're, you're seeing high blood pressures, but down the line, you're gonna see low blood pressures when the clamp comes off. Again, keep that in the back of your mind. So some people like to use nitroglycerin to help when the clamp goes on with two thoughts in mind. One, you're gonna decrease preload since nitroglycerin is more of a preload agent, doesn't have that great of effects on afterload, but we do know it has pretty reasonably strong effects on coronary vasodilation. So maybe it's gonna help with increasing coronary blood flow for that heart that's now working a little bit harder. We'll talk more about the clamping and considerations during the case once we get to that slide in a couple minutes. So spinal cord is something else to think about, especially when you're talking about aortic aneurysm repairs, whether it's endovascular or it's open. So your spinal cord, what, what do you guys remember about the spinal cord and blood flow? Yep, and spinal cord, and what what is the supply to spinal cord? Okay, and um, and the concern for this is going to be is that it's coming off of your aorta, so where you're clamping could actually be affecting the blood flow to the uh, spinal cord. So you're going to hope that you have good collateral flow. So if you're, and this is no different than when you do a cerebral perfusion pressure, you always calculate. Um, the ICP in order to figure out what the actual cerebral perfusion pressure is because if you have to overcome a pressure to send a pressure there's less pressure that you're sending and so this is the same concept so you know in order to supply blood to the spinal cord if there's an increase in pressure uh, at the spinal cord or post spinal cord as far as drainage goes it's going to be you're going to need even higher pressure to overcome that so one of the things that you can do is you can drain csf to promote forward flow of blood during uh, conditions or states where you might have a clamp on or you might have a decrease in blood flow because of um, of aneurysms, rupturing aneurysms or whatever it is so drainage i've seen these drains be placed they don't get placed all the time but the idea is to help with um cord perfusion you place the drain between C L3, L4. You, you don't want to place the drain where their spinal cord is, so it's the same concept of putting in a um, spinal anesthetic. The difference is, is that you're putting in a much larger needle and you're leaving a catheter after you, uh, you access the uh, subarachnoid space. There's things to remember, which is don't drain too much too fast. So within the first hour, you can drain 20, and then within a four hour period, they say less than 40. So kidneys are really important to keep in mind. Where are you clamping? Are you clamping suprarenal or infrarenal? And if it comes, even when you're infrarenal, and this is the same thing, where are they get, where is the defect when it comes to endovascular? Endovascular aneurysm repairs is they go in through the grind and they're gonna, um, they're gonna graft where the defect is. They can reinforce the lining of the artery that has an issue. That graft is long. And if the defect is really close to the renals, the concern is always if the graft gets deployed where the renal arteries take off from the aorta. So that could become a problem as well. So yes, clamping is pretty is pretty obvious when you're clamping if you know you're at or above or below the renal offtakes. But the grafting too is a is a concern as well in case you deploy a graft and that starts to block your renal arteries and then you drop perfusion to the kidneys. The other thing is is all vascular procedures involve usually uh, contrast. So they're using contrast under fluoro to be able to see what the actual blood flow looks like, where they are, what's the defect look like. So the overall amount of contrast that's given can contribute to kidney uh, injuries as well. And then large shifts in 
large shifts in hemodynamics, mostly low blood pressures, can also affect the kidneys. The kidneys are used to perfusing at higher pressures. We have to maintain something within that 20%. It's not just, a, just, it's not just for cerebral perfusion, but it's also for renal perfusion too. It's for all perfusion. I mean, it doesn't matter what organ it is. Uh, once that autoregulation shifts because of higher blood pressures, we want to try and maintain that if possible and safe to do so, depending on what part of the procedure you're doing. So right before cross clamping is not the time to have to be starting off with pressures at 160 when you know that the pressures might go to 200. And then when you're about to unclamp, starting off with pressures of 100 right before you take the clamp down is probably not going to be good for this patient because you might be in the 80s or 70s before you can recover them because they dropped the clamp and you weren't prepared for it. What can we do by carb drip? That was in one of the previous lectures, but uh, earlier than on the slides. So bicarb drips. It can be kidney, it can be um, kidney protective. You can also avoid drugs that are nephrotoxic. One of the big determinants of comorbidities and mortality after aortic surgery is clamp time suprarenal. So you it's like the golden number that they all look for is 30 minutes. Uh, the case I did the other day, unfortunately, were like 38 minutes, and but it's pretty significant. You want to be under 30 minutes. So everyone is sort of like cognizant of that time. And it's every, it's not the time for learners to be doing these surgeries. Like at that time, I've never seen residents do the surgery. When they go super renal clamp time, it's the surgeon plus maybe another surgeon that are going to you know team up and try and, and do the, uh, the vascular surgery as fast as they can and then be able to drop the clamp as they then do whatever else. So in this case, I think they they did the super renal, we did super renal, they fixed the defect for that spot and then worked on everything distally afterwards. But that's where they have everything set up, ready to go, where they're gonna tie the graft in or what they're gonna stand <coughs> with before they actually clamp. Mannitol is also something to consider. I would say you absolutely should give mannitol if you're doing super renal uh, to also promote kidney protection. So it's typically about 0.5 grams per kilogram 30 minutes prior to clamping. Um, I've seen some tech, textbooks say 15. What I find is, is that the surgeons will just check the box and you'll give the, the mannitol and then they'll just start. And that's not ideal either. So this, you should have the conversation. I feel like we didn't do a good job. I didn't do a good job of that in my case a couple days ago, but we should have the conversation during the case or before the case starts about mannitol, and then we should give it as soon as possible. Um, in our case, we weren't supposed to go super renal. We were anticipating infrarenal. It was only after they got access all the way down that we, were, we decided we're, we're gonna, that we, he decided he was gonna do super renal. Even when you're infrarenal, are still most likely decreasing blood flow to the renal arteries. So don't think because you're below the uh, where the renals take off the aorta that you're in you're safe. You're still going to have uh, you're still going to have an effect on the renal blood flow. It's it's less than 40 percent, but it's something that's still significant. Um, you do have collateral circulation. So the collateral circulation is what you're hoping is perfusing the, the renal artery, or the kidneys. Um, and that's why you wanna be careful to maintain a, a reasonable blood pressure while clamped. I don't see anyone ever doing dopamine for renal perfusion, um, but it's, it's in the literature. So the aorta is typically two to three centimeters in diameter. When it becomes a problem is when the aneurysm grows to like certain sizes. So anything less, anything greater than 5.5 centimeters, or if you have a large increase in the aneurysm in a short amount of time is a big concern. People will typically get serial exams, depending on how fast your aneurysm is growing over the course of months to years. Uh, it's patient specific. There's big risk factors for this. And one of the ones that we see that is the most common is smoking. And that's why a lot of these patients are gonna have lung disease as well. So you're not only managing their hemodynamic instability from this case, but you're also having to manage the way that their lungs are gonna to respond to all the interventions that you're doing with the heart. Um, 
and as well as just trying to ventilate them the best you can. High blood pressure is usually very common. Um, they usually have an, a degree of renal insufficiency. There are some studies that show that there's increase, significant increases based on creatinine function. I don't think I listed that, and I can't remember off the top of my head what those numbers are. But obviously, if you have a creatinine clearance less than 60, and creatinines that are greater than like 1.3, 1.4, you're just looking at someone who's going to have a much harder chance of leaving the hospital and surviving the procedure. Even if we're only talking a couple points uh, percent, it's still pretty significant. One of the things I noticed in the literature is that uh, smoking contributes more to the abdominal aorta than the thoracic. It's nothing clinically relevant, but just to keep in mind and stuff. We also see a lot of patients that come in that don't have good primary care uh, visits or they're not followed up well. So, you know, just keep me back your head too that, you know, as far as controlling hemodynamics on any induction on any patient, I mean, in their like 20 year smoking history or pack history, that they could have these larger aneurysms and you would never know it as you're inducing people. So, what's your tolerance in general on people who've maybe they haven't taken care of themselves as well, don't see any doctors, they come in for the lap api and they're like severely hypertensive, tachy tachycardic after you DL. And yeah, if you put them on high SIVO and like give them like a minute or two, they usually level out once you get the tube in. But how much, how much time do they really have when they have maybe an unstable aneurysm that's six centimeters? I don't know the answer to that, but that's always in the back of my mind. It's not too hard to treat those things in the interim than it is to sit there and just like cross your fingers, you know, that it doesn't, you know, burst. So Marfan syndrome is another risk. So Marfan syndrome has some like other things to think about, which is it has connective tissue disorder associated with it. Um, so they typically have like uh, associations with like our disease associations with the aortic root and uh, that's where they could have dilation or um, dissection. So that would be like a thoracic case, uh, high, high risk and, you know, most likely involving like cardiac bypass. So we can do endovascular repair of the thoracic aortic aneurysms. So you just have to assess, is it ascending, is it the arch, or is it descending? I think the closer you get to the heart, the more risk that you have, especially on the ascending and the arch component, which is going to require bypass. You're placing graphs here. So when you're placing graphs, remember you're placing like this sort of like mesh netting that has sort of like a collagen-like structure to it. And they have to place this uh, through fluoro. Usually, you'll see where they're placing it shows up, and you have to be careful of all the offtakes, right? If you're thinking in the arch in particular, you know you're worried about your first offtakes and your right subclavian. Then your next offtake is, I think, your left internal carotid or common carotid, and then the next one would be like your left subclavian. So you risk possibly obstructing those, and so you know big concerns there. So depending on obviously where the thoracic area aneurysm is, or the side where, what facility you're going to use in the hospital. This is, I think, is just showing you the different classifications for thoracic area aneurysms. So type one, two, three, four, and then I guess a five. This is a chart that the um, class of 2020, I want to say, made um, as far as some of the risk factors. I'm not going to ask any specific questions from this graph, but you can see type 2 has a lot more risk factors than the rest do. So it's general. The time depends on where the aneurysm is and how bad it is or how difficult it is to access. There's going to be a degree of carbon cardiopulmonary bypass, you need to have pretty much a lot of similar things we talked about for the abdominal aortic aneurysms. It's ideal to have, in, in this case, you're going to have to, you should really have TE, a CVP, and A-line. In the abdominal aortic aneurysms, I think it all depends on preference of who you're working with and like risk factors. Uh, lumbar drain is definitely something you should be considering. Um, they like to do the um, 
A line to the right arm because if you have a graph that might distal on the aorta, you're going to have a graph that could possibly block the left subclavian more likely than the, than the right innominate artery. When they're deploying these graphs, it doesn't matter what procedure they're doing a graft in, but anytime you're deploying a graft in like a high flow artery, which the aorta is, they'll do grafts in the distal arteries too. So I just want to say in general, probably the rule of thumb might make sense, but you don't want to have like large changes in like hemodynamics or high blood pressures, because remember that they're deploying a graft from below, from the femoral area, and the blood pressure is trying to push against that where they're, point, where they're deploying the graft. So high blood pressures can cause the graft to get malpositioned or not to deploy in the right area. The other reason too with the A-line to the right arm is that under certain situations, they may access the left brachial artery. And since you're so high up with this, Again, artery damp quits and spinal perfusion is even bigger concern because you're definitely north of where that, that artery is being perfused from. So here it says lower the systolic blood pressure to 50 to 60, which is pretty, pretty significant. ACT in most of these cases are anywhere from 200 to 250. It's going to be surgeon specific. So just, again, have the ACT machine in the room. Know who's going to actually run the ACT. I think it's better when the OR staff runs it because you're going to be busy managing the patient. And it just takes time to constantly run ACTs, especially if they're subtherapeutic and you're, they're not on heparin drips and stuff. And you're just bolusing and stuff. So it's a lot easier to have someone else in the room doing it. Um, at Yale, it's hit or miss where you are, who does it. But like for the the um, adult Anders and we did two days ago, we were doing it, and it's just time consuming because we're we're also trying to send off ABGs as well because you're trying to assess people's overall pH status, base excess, um, PaO2. You're looking at how their the respiratory system's working, the cardiovascular system's working, and if you're doing TEE, you're also doing that as well. So there's really no time to be doing ACTs, but we have to stay heparinized, otherwise these patients run the risk of having massive clots, which could go to the brain or clog off distal arteries and organs. So when you think about spinal cord perfusion and the risk of spinal cord um, ischemia, SSCPs work really well. It's the same thing that we would normally do when we're doing back surgeries and stuff, and we're putting direct pressure and or ischemia to the actual spinal cords. So SSCP MEP monitors are really helpful. Um, so we can do those, so if you do them, the only consideration is basically what kind of anesthetic are you gonna run. Most places don't want you to run more than half MAC, even that the neurologist or neurobiologist or whatever they call themselves, um, they'll say that those can also, uh, even at a half MAC can affect them. So in a perfect world, you're gonna run Tiva with no inhalation agent. If you do that though, I highly suggest after having a couple recent instances of recall in the hospital, make sure you give them Versed. Or if you don't want to give them Versed, you know, say because of age or for whatever reason, at the bare minimum then, have a BIS monitor on these people. Um, and then also talk to the, the neuro monitoring people. They don't always run EEGs, but they are looking at the reactivity on the SSCPs and they can see basically how awake and responsive their SSCPs are. And it's, it's not, you're not going to be able to support yourself in a, if you got sued that, oh, well, the neuromonitoring said that they looked asleep on their on their SSCPs. They weren't that active, but it does help confirm whether it's matching with your BIS monitor. But I always use a BIS monitor when I do TIVA, or most of the time I try to. I can't say I always do. It doesn't matter what the case is. I always do it. I'll give you an example. I was actually doing pediatric anesthesia a couple weeks ago. Did I tell you the story with the IV? So pediatric anesthesia, we were, we run gas and we run probe on a lot of kids because the thought is, is that the kids wake up a little bit more smooth on the probe because they'll usually breathe off the gas. We wake everyone up deep. So like they'll usually, they'll wake, they'll have SIBO on board when you exubate them, but 
you, in my mind, without having a way to check this, the probe probably takes longer to wake up from than the SIBO, because as they breathe to pack you asleep, they probably blow the SIBO off, and then they wake up slowly from probe. I give almost all the kids Presidex, so that's that's on board too. But um, during the case, um, I had I probe go to like 100 mics per kilogram per minute. Um, patients at dental case are completely wrapped up like a taco and uh, their heads even wrapped up it's just their mouth that's really exposed and neck and at some point we notice like propofol on the ground and so instantly knew like the IV must be out but I luckily had gas on board but how long did it take until we realized that so had this been someone who's paralyzed and I think that's probably the good good point to make is you're if you're paralyzing people and running Tiva you better have some type of entropy or BIS on entropy is another competitor to BIS you better have something on that gives you a warning early on like BIS is up at 70 and you're like looking around and you're like why you know where's the IV have you looked at it maybe you have to assess that every 15 minutes when you're running Tiva without an inhalation agent because propofol is not as good of an amnestic as SIBO is, but with SIBO, we know it's always working because we get that expiratory back in our machine when it's monitoring it. So anyways, it's the muscle accent too, I think, component because the patient won't buck, they won't move and start localizing. So in this case, this kid's, we don't paralyze them, but we had the SIBO on. But long story short, how long was it filling up in the bed then onto the floor? When I went to assess the IV, it was even worse than I expected. The way that the IV tubing had come off was it had somehow, had a defect where the actual lural lock part that the hard plastic that you normally tie into the IV that was still on the IV the tubing came out of that it goes inside that hole and it's like the part that screws on the tubing came out of that so I don't know if it came out of it because it had pressure at the IV site or it got pulled by one of the dentists and stuff it's probably a combination of both but that didn't take that much force because the IV itself was perfectly taped. The tape never came off the line where it was taped at the three-way and stuff. It looked like there was no trauma to it. And the, plate, the patient actually bled into the bed. So imagine having a four-year-old that's like 20 kilos and it saturated the bed from like the chest up in blood and you never saw the blood. It was just when enough came out that the propofol dropped on the ground. It's like a really like, it's a nightmare situation. And so, you know, I sent the hemoglobin patients seem like hemodynamically they're doing fine, but like, what if that patient was having hemodynamics instability during a dental procedure? Would you be thinking the bed's filled with blood or would you be thinking that they injected like marcaine in their gums and the gums, you know, they absorb too much and they're going through like local anesthetic toxicity? Like, I don't know if I would go to the, the beds covered in blood first. I'd probably be thinking bigger things, but hemoglobin was fine. The patient did well. It was a RL solution. We do that. It's like a reporting system. And there was a really awkward conversation with like the mom was like, you know, patient, you know, theoretically could have died, um, but we caught the problem, the mistake, and we're gonna look into it. We'll do, you know, we'll do a uh, a review, and we'll hopefully figure out what we could do better next time. Um, so, Tiva, <laughs> Tiva's good, but just be careful. So we can do endovascular repair of the aortic aneurysm too in the abdominal. Just remember this all depends on where, this, where it is. You can do endovascular repair for almost anything. That's where a majority of vascular anesthesia is now. This is abdominal aortic aneurysm. This graph is, is it's transitioning away from thoracic. So most are inferior to the renal arteries, which is good. You still might have blood flow problems, even if they're inferior. We talked about the associations with it. And the reason why EVAR is usually better than open is because you're not clamping. So there's more stability. It's less stimulating when you access the grinds. You use local, they'll go into the grinds and stuff. They obviously have to go into the uh, arterial femoral uh, arteries and stuff. There's supposedly less incidence of embolotic events, which is good. If you're cleaning out the atherosclerosis or the plaque and stuff, that could be shot distally from where that site is. It's definitely less blood loss. And if there's less stimulation, there's less stress, less inflammation, which is good. And hopefully less renal dysfunction because you're not clamping. Most Adamoeric aneurysms are not symptomatic. 
they are usually found uh, during routine exams or from studies for something else. So keep that in mind too, as far as these are the risk factors for them and these are the patients that you're seeing. If they've never been assessed for it, they may have it. So endovascular repair, you can actually do these under MAC, general, or neuraxial. So if you have a patient that you're really worried about that has enormous comorbidities, cardiac and respiratory, obviously doing general anesthesia puts them at even more risk. So you can theoretically do neuroaxial. So if you did a spinal on these patients and you had someone that was a really good surgeon that can get this procedure done quick, depending on how long and stuff, you could do a spinal, you could do a CSE, you could do a spinal epidural, and you could theoretically keep them awake if you were really that worried. Um, you can also do MAC. So MAC's basically, in, in our world, is usually general without an artificial airway. You question, obviously, as you're doing MAC and stuff with these patients with coexisting respiratory disease, you can't really monitor what their end tidal CO2 is because there's really no way to know when you're breathing in a mass and it's mixing with air and nitrogen. So you're not gonna have good control over their ventilation status. So it's a little more challenging. You know, if you're at the point where you're doing MAC anesthesia and these patients are obstructing and you're putting in an oral airway and a nasal airway and stuff, you know, and, and maybe a nasal airway actually probably wouldn't be a good idea if they've been heparinized. Um, you're probably better off considering doing an LMA. And uh, you're basically doing general at that point when they're tolerating those things in their mouth and their, their nasal airways or their nasal passages. So anytime you're doing anything with the aortic aneurysms, you should always have a type and screen. You have to question whether or not you want to have um, blood available. And available means you know in the OR or in the core area. Um, versus being available at the blood bank. Uh, it's probably better to always have it in the core and then you can return it as long as it stays refrigerated and cooled. A-line is, I would say you should always have an A-line. And here it says consider an A-line. Large bore IVs is 16 gauge and above. Um, Harford people, what's a large gauge IV that you see clinically being placed usually? 18. I think yeah, it's the same thing. You'll see it's like 18 when you say large gauge, 16 or bigger, um, because you're going to get increased flows. I mean, you'll get better flows actually through a 16 gauge than you will through an 18 gauge on a central line. The only difference between the two is that a central line's central. So you're adding your vasoactive anotropic drugs into a large bath, right? So it's going to dilute itself quickly so that you're not going to cause any type of irritation or, you know, these are vesicant medications, so you're not going to possibly infiltrate um, around the uh, insertion site when you have a peripheral that's not really in right, right, or it's leaking a little bit. Um, so that's the only advantage of central lines, and it's a good advantage, but when you're talking about large volume resuscitation or giving blood and stuff, the only thing that beats putting in a 16 gauge or a 14 gauge is a cordis. Beyond that, that small length of catheter in relation to the long central line, that difference in length is an enormous amount of resistance. You just don't get good flow through a central line. And there's risk with central lines too. So you can't forget the fact that if you're putting in a central line, you could actually cause damage to the central line. It could get infected. They could die from the infection. Um, so you just have to make a, a, a clinical judgment on what's appropriate. In a lot of cases, we can do pretty much most cases without a central line. But again, you know, you're thinking in terms of this person's got systolic heart failure, not a great heart, EFs in like the 20, 30% range, probably very likely you're gonna want inotropes. And if you think you're gonna need a lot of like inotropic and vasopressive like support, probably a central line makes sense, but you're still gonna to wanna to put in peripheral uh, lines that are big. So 16 gauge or bigger. Endo leaks are complications, which actually go back to the O, go back for vascular procedures, you'll do endo leaks all the time. Um, endo leaks are just blood that's outside the graph. So like basically, if you thought of the graph, and I'll draw this up here, you know, so you have like your aorta, right? And then it branches off, what are these? The arteries branch off the aorta. Bigger than femoral. Iliac? Iliac? Iliac. 
Billy Ash. They were about. So you have like graphs that are like, it's like they're like meshy looking things, you know, like it's like kind of what the thing looks like. It's just like a mesh, you know, it's obviously hollow in the middle. When they deploy these graphs, they're looking at a fluoro and they're watching where it is. So it's a lot of uh, contrast being given. And you know, depending on where the defect is, we'll just say this is like the defect. So it's defects in the actual lining of the aorta. You have involvement of like the three different layers of, of the aorta. So there's your defect. You know, you're you run the risk of either you run the risk of this rupture, you run the risk of this like grossly expanding between the vessel layers. But right now we'll just look at it as like one one layer. But there's three layers and all these uh, kind of all these different blood vessels. So the goal is, is to get this graph above and below here. So we'll come in, depending on the vasoturf, it's str the straighter approach and the less loopy and crazy the vessels are leading up to the order. That's the side they'll usually go in. So they probably already assess this. They may have that, both the morals down here, you know, access. They come up with their device and they'll try and deploy it, you know, between like here and here. But even when this device is in here, blood can sometimes skirt around this and then continue to fill up around here. And those are end leaks. So they, they go back, it's a new procedure weeks later, whatever it is, and they put coils in there. So basically like if you had a hole in the ground, like, a road, right, and it's filling with water, and your car drives into it and hits it. It's a big, you know, shock on you. They just go in and they put more gravel in there. In this case, they just add coils and try and fill that space with coils, and they look just like coils. And they'll deploy stuff in here, and they'll just fill that up, and that keeps it from accepting too much blood and creating more of an endo leak. So at any point the graft is foreign, it can actually get infected. So you could be taking back a patient that has an infected graft. So sepsis is a concern. All those considerations are in play. And it can move. It can migrate. So, you know, probably it's going to migrate distal with blood flow. But, you know, if it migrates down one of the iliacs or blocks below the iliacs, you might see that with decreased perfusion uh, modeled like left leg, if it was the left side or right leg and so on. If there's a complication or a rupture during the endovascular procedure, because they actually rupture the aneurysm or anything goes wrong, you're always gonna be doing, you're always gonna be ready to do an open procedure. So if they're intubated, it's not as big of a deal as if they're under MAC, right? Or if they're under neuraxial, you know, anesthesia, that's going to be a bigger deal, especially if they're awake. I've never done an awake patient, but you theoretically could if you're really aware about their, their heart and lungs. So it could happen quickly. They could lose a lot of blood quickly. That's why you probably should have blood in the room or immediately available. And having the large access, it's always like who you all know that, you know, Putting in a 16 or 14 is not easy. You're not going to find everyone has a great blood vessel, especially vascular patients. So the last thing you want to do is be like, what are we going to do? You know, like we're crashing this patient to sleep. What would you get for medicine if patients, let's say, under MAC? Let's assume they're under MAC. So let's assume they have a propofol drip going. And now they've like, they're just cutting open the belly. Um, if they're under MAC, but without neuraxial anesthesia, because that gives really good you know, he, uh, really good analgesic. The the neuro, you have to think about all these things too. So like, if you're under neuroaxial anesthesia and you are doing an endovascular repair, remember what's covered as far as dermatones go. What do you think's covered? What do you think they did for the anesthetic? Let's assume it's a spinal. Like, what dermatone down can you assume are covered? So may, maybe maybe. Maybe, like, I wouldn't say even T10. I would say, like, you know, even below that, probably. More towards where your iliac crests are, like, in that lumbar region. Because if you're using an isotonic bricity, such as half percent marcane plane, and you place it, obviously, below the spinal cord, you can't do a spinal above L1, L2. You're really just giving analgesia somewhere below the iliac crest. 
Um, and if they're now going to crash someone, to, you're going to crash them to sleep, and they're going to make a decision from their xiphoid down for an open AAA repair, and it's going to be a big one. They're not going to go. They're not going to go lightly. They're going to get exposure as fast as they can. Your spinal's not going to work. So, you know, it's something to think about. You can't do anything about that. If you had a, if you had an epidural in, can you do something about the location? So most of the time we talk about OB anesthesia and in the parturian, the epidural is lumbar. And we only really care about it helping with some general sensory control over contractions, right? But not too much that they can't push. But, um, but when it's time to go to a C-section, we, we have to convert it to a C-section epidural, which is just fancy for what? What could we do with an epidural if we had to get the sensory level up a little bit? Volume. Yep. And then how do we, if we wanted to, I don't think in a crash case scenario, some people would say that the sympathectomy from an epidural or spinal is actually a reason why they wouldn't want to do it for these cases if they crash them to sleep and had to convert to open because you can't control the hemodynamics after you give the local anesthetics. Remember, like we're playing with this right now. This is all like, this is all patient specific, surgeon, and then your comfortability as an anesthesia provider, whether some will say, I don't like to use spinals, epidurals ever, even epidurals for big open cases. I don't like to dose them until the end of the case because I want full control over hemodynamics. But again, we're assuming we have it. We're just, we're theorizing for educational purpose right now that we could just use the epidural. So spinal, we're kind of out of luck, nothing we can do. Epidural, we can give more volume to get the level to go up. We do this with the perturians in emergencies, right? Patient, the baby's decelerating, so you know that the baby's not doing well. They've probably had some short D cells, but once they have significant D cells where their heart rates go to 60 and below, it's an emergency. It's a stat C section and it's time. It's all about getting volume on fast, right? So you can get the volume up to somewhere around, you know, maybe like, let's say xiphoid's probably reasonable. So what, what's xiphoid? T6, T6, T4 is, a, I have to think about it. So yeah, so T6, it's probably reasonable. But now you're causing a sympathectomy of all those layers as you go up on someone who's actively bleeding through an aorta that you don't have control over. You haven't clamped it yet to stop the bleeding. Um, so just keep that in mind, it is possible. Um, if you have to just crash them to sleep and they're just Mac, they localize the grind, they got in, the patient's tolerating with a little versatile and fentanyl, you know, that's a little different than two. So now you have a baseline of anesthesia that's on board. And so the patient's, you know, somewhere to sleep, tolerating what they're doing. And I always say, you know, you have, you, you always, three things you're always thinking about when you're in these cases, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what case it is. If you're precepting with me, I'm always like, look, are you ventilating? Is your blood pressure or hemodynamically stable? And do you have enough anesthesia for what you're doing right there and then? Right there and then, with these catheters in, they're, they're localized. You don't need that much. When they're getting access, and, and if they're deploying a graph, like they're going to probably have bigger devices in, you don't need that much. At a certain point, they kind of plateau out. But if you're about to put a breathing tube through their vocal cords, they're going to need more anesthesia. So what would you do then? What would you guys think to do? Like, this is you. You're in the room. Your preceptor, like, left you because, like, now you've been seen. You're, you're kind of becoming... Um, super juniors or super second years now, right? Like you're getting better and better at this. Like you're gonna have more and more autonomy and stuff. You'll start being immune to yourself. So let's even, let's just assume you're with a preceptor, they're out break and this person you've called for help now. And it's like, you know, you gotta control this airway and you know you have to prepare for this patient to be cut open. Um, so what would you do? What would, what would you do in order to facilitate your intubation? If, but you probably don't have it out. You might. Maybe you want the ketamine super good skin analgesic, but let's assume it's not even out. So to me, ketamine's gonna take too much time. But ketamine's actually not a bad idea. Definitely, I think that's a good good answer. But let's assume it's not out and it's not in the pixis. So you have to go get it. What else would you do? But if you bolus the propofol, what's gonna happen to the blood pressures? Could drop, right? Yeah, I think always adding, I've done a lot more cardiac stuff more recently in the last couple of years. So we're doing a lot of stuff in EP lab, not bypass, but EP lab. 
And I see a lot of times, like the people who do only cardiac, I'm like, it's a good habit. There are all these older people with diastolic dysfunction issues or just, you know, people have vascular disease. Giving a little phenylephrine with your induction agents always helps. What else could you do? So I think that's a good answer, definitely. What have you guys seen? I mean, have you ever had to crash someone to sleep yet? What's gonna happen? Especially trauma. What do you actually need in order to intubate someone? So you could give sucks, right? So if the patient's not end stage renal, you're not worried about hyperkalemia, you could just give them sucks and intubate them. The problem is, is that you're, you are worried about, like if you totally paralyze them, you can just intubate them right away, right? Get the tube in, that's fine. But it, during the DL process, you could over stimulate them and they can become tachycardic hypertensive, which might be good while you're bleeding because it's better than being hypotensive, but you also don't want to have them have an MI. So you could, yeah, you could do that. Absolutely. Um, you know, some people, most people would probably just be like, you know, give probe, give a muscle relaxant. You could give a large dose of rock, but what if you can't intubate them? You haven't been pre-oxygenating them, right? Because they're breathing through a mask or a nasal cannula. So you got to be careful. You're going to have no downtime in a case like this. Um, so there's not a right answer, but these are some of the things I'd be thinking about. And if you do give probe, what dose would you give? Less. Less, right? There's no right answer. So you think, oh, one and a half to two milligrams. No, they have Versed fat on board and they have a probe drip running. You, know, you might only have to give half a milligram per if it's an older person and depending on how many agents and adjuncts you have going and stuff. Um, so there's really not a right answer, but those are like, th that's kind of like my mindset. So I think you guys had good answers for it. All right, for open, we'll take a break and then we'll start the open stuff. So if you ever have a patient who actually has a known aortic aneurysm and you can find a chart that tells you what the actual diameter is, if it's greater than six, you know that 50% of these patients will rupture within a year. So your likelihood of this person rupturing at a laparoscopic api, cholecystectomy, whatever procedure that's not related to this is very high. And you need to be very cognizant of whether or not this patient needs the surgery, can tolerate the surgery, or needs to get more of a workup and or intervention for the aneurysm before they have something else done that's unnecessary or too risky to have done now under the current conditions. So abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs typically have blood losses that are around a liter. It's the average, 500 to 1,000, depending on how complicated it is. They'll last near from three to five hours. I've seen some go upwards of six to seven hours. They'll be supine. They'll have general and ideally with an epidural for anesthetic and analgesic control during the case. Complications are associated with the, the vast changes in hemodynamics from hypoperfusion to hyperperfusion, depending on blood loss, depending on duration of the case, and depending also on whether you're clamped or unclamped. To prepare for the case, you want to make sure that you place an A-line. A CVP is strongly indicated on patients that you have that have a high likelihood of needing inotropic support or very caustic vasopressive medications like dopamine, norepinephrine that aren't ideal to give in a, in, in a small peripheral vessel. Patients need two large bore IVs. A 16 gauge or bigger is considered a large bore IV and the flow that you're gonna get from a 16 gauge or a 14 gauge is far gonna surpass the flow you're gonna get in a central line that has an 18 gauge at best lumen, which is so long that the change from the start to the finish is gonna have a lot of uh, resistance, which is gonna limit the blood flow or the volume flow through and make it not an ideal catheter for volume resuscitation. So a 16 or, eight or, or 14 gauge is the best catheter to go with. Having two is most ideal. You wanna make sure your OG tube goes in before you heparinize. And then the other thing is, is if you're doing a epidural, you wanna make sure that the epidural goes in an hour before you heparinize as well. You should have available in the room and probably hung 
vasoactive drugs that can either raise or lower the blood pressure, hung and ready to go. In addition to that, you should consider mannitol, especially if you're doing something that's super renal or someone with renal disease. Mannitol should be given 15 to 30 minutes before the clamp, and you wanna give about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. All the rooms, all these cases, you should have in the room blood available, two to four units, cross match, type and screen done well ahead of time, and ready to go before you even start the case. So again, epidural anesthesia is I, the most ideal thing that you can do for this patient. It has significant effects on post-operative recovery, decreasing risk factors associated with this case, and balancing out the, the large fluctuations in hemodynamics from, from pain and from clamping. It does have downsides when someone has uncontrolled hemorrhage, the sympathectomy from the epidural can hinder your abilities to maintain adequate perfusion. Using an epidural during the case is usually anesthesia and anesthetist dependent, I guess. I like using it and I like to use it in a way that is safe and, and titratable, usually, usually giving doses of two cc's of very diluted marcaine, either eighth or, eighth or quarter percent marcaine, or having them on infusions of like five to eight cc's an hour with a little bit of narcotic is usually a good, it's sometimes a good technique. The other thing you can do is, is you can wait to actually start using local anesthetic to bolus the epidural until after you've really settled them with the anesthetic levels that are necessary for the case. In the meantime, before you're ready to give the local anesthetic, especially before the clamp time, what you can do very early on is you can bolus the epidural with narcotic only. You wanna give narcotics in volume because you're giving small amounts of narcotics here in the epidural space. You wanna make sure that you have a chance for it to spread out throughout the epidural space and bathe the roots of all the different uh, nerves that are coming out from the spinal cord. So typically you wanna put in about five to eight cc's and give just the lot or just fentanyl before you even consider giving the local anesthetic later on. And the epidural, the reason why it helps so much is it's attenuating the response to painful stimuli and reduces the overall inflammatory markers, therefore increasing the success and the chances of quicker recoveries and not having to worry about some of the complications of narcotics. It does a much better job with the analgesic control postoperative so people can take deep breaths and breathe and not develop allotasis. It also shows to decrease uh, graft occlusions postoperatively and decrease the risk of MI. So for inductions, you have to assume with the cardiovascular disease these patients already have, that they have a high chance of having a cardiovascular incident, uh, an infarct in their, one of their in an area of their myocardium. So you gotta be careful on how you induce these people. You don't wanna give large doses of propofol. You wanna weight base it and adjust for age and give it in smaller amounts over longer periods of time, or possibly even consider giving a Tomidate instead of just propofol to reduce the cardiac depression from the inhalation agents or from the induction agents. People over 70 with diastolic heart failure are at higher risk for hypotension, especially if they're intravascularly depleted. So you wanna get some fluid on boards as soon as you get into the room. Again, patient specific, if they don't have systolic heart failure, but they have diastolic heart failure or they don't have either, they would benefit from fluid up front and then inducing them slowly is important. And possibly chasing your induction agents with a little bit of phenylephrine to offset the side effects of the induction agents. And a line's always better if you can have it before you do your induction so you know during induction if you've overshot what the patient needs to go to sleep. However, in some cases, people are gonna place the A-line after they go to sleep because it's tolerated better that way. Should you put the A-line in ahead of time, a nice wheel with lidocaine, raising a nice wheel with lidocaine works great, and then using ultrasounds so you're not guessing where the artery is, and because these vascular patients have more difficult arteries to access anyways, using an ultrasound goes a long way, so it's quicker, it's easier, and it's less traumatic placing the arterial line. When you go to sleep, you should have these drugs ready here for bolusing. So you wanna be able to bolus anywhere from 10 to 30 milligrams of esmol if they get tachycardic. Micardamine, you wanna bolus anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams. You want it drawn up in 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per cc. Nitro, you wanna dilute from the vial to about 40 mics per cc, and then bolus about 40 mics at a time.
Nitroglycerin is a great drug for dropping preload. It has a little bit of effect on afterload. It does dilate the coronaries, which can be helpful if the heart's under increased demand. The nitroglycerin uh, can be given in larger doses, but you want to first see how the patient responds to smaller doses and titrate it to effect. The cardipine is a calcium channel blocker, and it works on the systemic vasculature, predominantly on the arterioles, and works great at lowering the afterload for the heart and thereby decreasing the blood pressure. For maintenance, SIBO is typically preferred. It has some cardioprotective effects. It's very titratable. If the person's pressures are really high, you can, you can increase your flows on the ventilator and increase your SIBO for and pass the 2% that you're used to for one MAC before you age adjust it. You go to 4% and it's temporary, but it allows you to decrease the pressure safely while you turn on your vasodilator drips if the pressure is too high. If the pressure is too low, you can decrease your sevoflurane quickly and get the pressure, get the sevo low enough where you still hopefully have an amnesia on board while you're also titrating up your vasoconstrictors and or inotropes depending on the patient's heart in order to get the MAP back to a normal range. Patients that undergo vast procedures typically have comorbidities for, for lung disease and COPD more specifically from years of smoking. So these people do well with SIBO because it helps bronchodilate, which is going to help with your ventilation perfusion mismatching from just doing general anesthesia. All your monitors should have the ST segments monitoring continuously, so you have to activate that if it's not already there. The arterial waveform can also display a, a pressure uh, variation, which allows you to kind of estimate their, their response to fluid. The more variability, typically over 12 to 13, if you're over that, it means you're very variable. There's lots of differences in the peaks of the different, uh, the different uh, cardiac contractions. This indicates the patient may respond to fluid and or blood. If you're under 12 to 13, they're probably not going to respond well based on Frank Starling's uh, law and that curve to volume resuscitation. I would consider the CVC if you have systolic dysfunction in low EF states because you're probably going to need inotropes or drugs that are both inotropy and vasoconstrictive like levofed dopamine. TE is by far a a solid tool and one of the best tools you can have for assessing person's status. The TE can tell you if you're hypotension, it can look hypotensive, it can tell you what's in the left ventricle and if you're if the person needs more resuscitation, more volume. Um, it also assesses the contractility of the uh, the heart and can show whether something's hypokinetic or akinetic and if there's changes during the case or after the clamps down and you see that sort of stunned heart from the acidemia load. So the TE tells you quite a bit of information. The SWAN is going to tell you a lot of info about the right heart, which is important if you had right heart dysfunction or underlining severe COPD pulmonary hypertension. It's not as accurate for guessing what the left uh, filling pressures are when you have diseased right lungs or you have incompetent valves on the right side of the heart, but it is one more tool to be able to assess things. This is where advanced non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring is like find you can find one of its best homes because you can do you can do advanced monitoring and be able to really guide your your hemodynamic drugs or your vasoactive drugs to the patient specific needs by understanding uh, with the prior information from like things like the flow track or from ClearSight what the SVV is, what the stroke volume is, what the um, what the cardiac output is, what the afterload's being guessed at. And it gives you a better idea how to titrate your medications when you don't have access to a TEE and you don't have access to like a left heart cath. Uh, so advanced monitoring is an absolute must if you have it and you're not using TEE. So stroke volume variation, this graph actually tells you it gives you an illustration on the Frank Starling's law as far as how responsive the heart is to increasing preload. Uh, if you're if you're low on the Frank if you're low on the curve, that means that you're you're most likely going to respond to fluid and you're going to be able to increase your cardiac output. So down here, this says that I have room to add more volume to my heart, and the stretching of adding more volume is going to cause my heart rate to go up, but it's also going to cause me to contract stronger, thereby increasing my cardiac output. So preload is going to increase the stroke volume because it's going to increase the contractility. Once you get to the top of the curve, no matter how much more volume I add, it's not going to make a really big difference in cardiac output because right now stroke volume is equal, stroke volume is made up of preload, afterload, and contractility. In the case of preload, if I'm all preloaded out and I have all the volume that I can possibly fill the chamber with, 
if it can't contract any stronger, then it's not gonna make a big difference in cardiac output, whether I add more volume. If anything, it's gonna add more strain to the heart as I add too much preload to the heart. So in this case, this person's not gonna respond well to the preload, but may respond well to either increasing the inotropy, the contractility part of stroke volume, increasing the heart rate, which is cardiac output's heart rate times stroke volume, or just increasing the afterload if it's appropriate. Again, advanced hemodynamic monitoring would be able to show you those things and be able to you know, guide you in what would be the best next step if your MAP is low and now, well, is it your cardiac output's a problem, if the contractility is a problem, or is it an afterload issue if we think the preload is good? So 20% of baseline, you definitely want to send pre, intra, and post clamping uh, ABGs. Euvolemia is the goal, especially before you clamp, because the more volume on board, the more systemic vascular resistance changes you're going to see as you have larger stroke volumes trying to jam that into, you know, an area that has less compliance. Up to date, recommended to actually replace insensible loss from that large open um, incision. I'm usually on the fence with insensible loss, but this is not an unreasonable amount of fluid per hour. So lung protective strategies, you want to do something that's going to be able to produce low tidal volume, low stress on the, um, on the uh, lungs and the alveolar tissue, especially when you're retracting. You're going to have, sometimes you might have increase, uh, decreasing overall compliance because that lung can't drop, that diaphragm doesn't drop, it's not moving caudal as easily because you have retractors holding open the entire abdomen so that the surgeon can access. These patients have a very high risk for dynamic hyperinflation. It's worsened because of their, their disease or respiratory disease, since most of them also have some type of COPD. So you want to have longer IE ratios. There was some recommendations for plateau pressures, which we don't typically see, um, which was, you know, basically the ARDS patients, you want to keep them under 30. I mean, ideally under 20 would be great, but you know that when you're in ARDS, there's no way you're going to be under 20. But in this case, we're hoping there is no acute lung injury or ARDS going into the case. It could develop afterwards, but we're going to try and maintain plateau pressures under 20. The only way we can measure plateau pressures, and both our hospitals have it, is if you're in volume control settings and you're adding on some inspiratory pause time, you'll see plateau pressures. The machine will actually auto-calculate it. And again, that's when you can assess what their lung compliance is, the alveolar compliance is, versus when you look at peak inspiratory pressures, that's really telling you the resistance of flow and the conducting airways, which also includes your breathing circuit and then the endotracheal tube. So you want to keep those as low as you can because that's going to contribute to having lung injury. SATs above 92%, which is just like oxygenate the best you can. I didn't really mention why it had to be above 92, but you know, not, not giving too much oxygen, but you can surmise it's probably from hyperoxia and then free radical formations and stress from having high flow oxygen when it's not necessary. PEEP is a risk if you have COPD, but mostly if you have uh, boule and you have a risk for causing a, a pneumo during the case. But you also like PEEP because if more and more airways collapse because of all the retraction and the surgery, then you're going to have less compliance when you have less lungs to, to inflate. The alveoli are what really expand and allow for volume to be able to be placed in them, and that, that's compliance, right? More volume being able to put in a bucket versus less. The conducting airways aren't expanding necessarily as much as the overall surface area of the lung. So you can keep lungs recruited and also prevent allotasis by having PEEP on. So it's plus or minus. But you gotta just be careful what you're, what's going on with the patient and if you're breast stacking or having like hyperdynamic inflation. This was actually from a case this was actually from the case that we were we were doing. So ah, it's too bad that this is small. That's the sRNA with me. Can you see anything on there? Because I can see it on my screen. Nothing. I'll pull this up afterwards separately. But what you're I'll pull this up separately later. Okay, so pre-clamping, we talked about the vasodilators they have ready. 
you can do a couple different things, either bolus dosing, increasing the uh, anesthetic. If, you, if you've been trending high and you haven't been on phenylephrine or any type of vasoactive drug that's keeping your pressure high, then I would probably consider giving starting that dose that epidural ahead of time before you clamp. Because if you're already in like the 150s to 160s and stuff, it's probably time to give some of that epidural so you get the benefits of it, but it's also gonna help prepare you for the clamping. If you're on a phenylephrine drip, it's time to start titrating that down so that you can effectively start off with a pressure that's well below the risk fat, the risk which are associated with high blood pressures after clamping and the high afterload. The generic number, I don't know if there is one, but you definitely want to have people like under 180 is like pretty reasonable. It doesn't necessarily tell you what your afterload is because afterload is like a is afterload and maps don't correlate as well as like knowing what the um, maps are only one component to like understanding afterload. And there's also a component of cardiac output, right? So we don't know the cardiac output and how that's contributing to the actual afterload or SVR. We just see the map, but map tells you that it does tell you something. It's just, it's not the full picture. Make sure your mantle, I think one chart said 30 minutes, one, this one says 15. So 15 to 30 minutes would be the right answer prior to the clamp. You wanna make sure it's circulating and, and taking effect. Everything is about communication. So you, you gotta know when they're gonna clamp. In our case, it took them 20 minutes to clamp and they kept saying they're gonna clamp. And like, I think I was frustrated because I don't think I was doing a good job communicating. So it's kind of like, Okay, you're, are you saying you're going to clamp in five minutes? They kept saying they're going to clamp. And it's like, then we're lowering the blood pressure. And then it's like 10 minutes later, we're still not clamped. We're sitting there like, like, okay, like, you know, we got to change the verbiage here and say like, okay, we're going to clamp soon. We're not there yet. Okay, now we're going to clamp. Are you ready? You know, so it was a little challenging. I felt like the, the day didn't go as smooth as I was hoping to. So after they, um, they clamp, there, there's going to be a blood loss. They're going to clamp and they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to clamp and they could have a blood loss from when they open up the aneurysm. They're going to, there's going to be a liter of blood loss. So just monitor your, uh, your ABGs for hemoglobins. Uh, hemoglobins for cardiovascular patients, you might want to run them higher. So like one of the recommendations might be is to keep them above nine. Others might be keep them above eight. We don't like to transfuse in general settings with stable patients unless you're like above, uh, below seven. But in this case, if you waited to get the seven, which is what we typically are used to, you're gonna be like five by the time the blood gets there, by the time you hang it. So the idea is to always stay ahead of blood loss. So eight's not a bad number to shoot for if you don't have high risk for cardiac ischemia from low hemoglobin levels. And nine is probably a better number to shoot for if you do. That way you're always kind of ahead of the blood loss. As far as the once the graft goes in, so as you're as you're doing the graft and stuff, you're going to talk to the surgeon about what they want for blood pressure control. They may actually want the blood pressures a little bit lower as they're placing the graft, because they're trying to like do it in the in the, in a, at the most bloodless environment that they can. Um, and then after the graft, it's set up. It's they've sutured it to like the vessel and stuff. Then you're going to talk to them about what they want to maintain blood flow afterwards, and they're going to probably want it to be on a little bit of, a, of the more moderate side or slightly above what their normal maps are. Again, this is really variant variable on depending on what the surgeon wants. When they're unclamping, get ready for the massive influx of acidemia. This is just a fun graph to kind of go through with how, what, what steps you'd, you'd take or consider based on the person coming off the clamp. And that large influx of preload, as well as a mixture of like lactic acidosis and what that does to the heart with contractility and the whole vascular system, it's gonna vasodilate. So it's time to start giving a lot of fluid. As far as emergence and going to like the ICU, plan on an ICU bed. Don't go to PACU with these patients. And then just ask yourself, if you've done large volume resuscitation post clamp coming down and depending on blood loss too, hopefully also you're using cell saver. Cell saver is a great thing. You know, we were able to, we were able to recover out of 1200 blood loss, we were able to give back about 600 cc's of blood to the patient. So that allowed us to give no exogenous blood to this patient or no, you know, donor blood at all to this. We, he gave back all their blood, which is great. That's oncotic pressures, that's oxygen carrying types of fluid, like that's good. But um, 
you still have to assess the ABGs to see like where they're at with their acidosis and if you can extubate them. And, and the airway edema is the other thing too as far as overall volume that you give. So a cough leak's a good idea. There's really no consensus on what's the best way to assess a cough leak. Some people will just like, while the patient's not too light and their airway doesn't have anything in it, they'll just drop the cough and listen with a stethoscope if they hear an air, a air leak. Um, it's not, that's a subjective measure. What I like doing is I don't mind listening for a cough leak that way, but what I'm also doing is objectively looking at the volume uh, control setting. So if you're giving 500 cc's of tidal volume, you want to see the return, which is the actual number that's di that's dynamically changing, drop by about like 25 to 35%. So, you know, 25% of um, 500 cc's would be, what is that, about 100? Is it 100? 125. There you go. Um, which tells you that there is a cuff leak. It's an objective way of measuring the cuff leak, and it's something you can chart confidently because the patient's supine, and you're not going to probably have time to exhibit. You probably don't want to exhibit them on the bed because if something goes wrong during exhibition, something just goes south, they're on the operating room table ready to be, a, you know, re-explored. But that's my thought for cuff leaks. You can hear it, and then you can also see it on the uh, on the uh, ventilator. So FEMPOP bypass, this is basically exactly that. You're, you have a occlusion somewhere in the popliteal area and you're just gonna bypass the occlusion, the stenosis, the atherosclerosis, whatever it is. You can do those under MAC, under spinal anesthesia. AV fistulas are for people with end-stage renal disease. These are the patients that you want to see when they recently got dialysis, what their deficit was after dialysis. These are not the best patients to do dialysis on right before going back to, in this case, like this could also be take back fistulas, this could be fistula explorations, this is the person that has like problems with their fistula but they have a port in, whatever it is, they got dialysis. They're not the best patients to go right back to surgery if they just did the dialysis because they're going to have probably pretty wide swings in hemodynamic changes. Uh, depending on how much fluid was taken off, but you also you want to see what their potassium is. You want to be careful with these patients with like any type of RSI with giving succinylcholine. Um, understand that it could be remix. They may bleed more than other people depending on when their dialysis was. If you do these under max sedation for fistula creations, if they do like a, a regional block, and you're just going to do a little bit of propofol in a, in a mass, just remember that if their potassium's high and they're and a lot of these patients are on the bigger side. If they start to obstruct or they don't ventilate well because of the anesthesia and because of their body habitus, that the increasing carbon dioxide contributes to their acidotic load and then worsens the hyperkalemia. So if you start seeing arrhythmias, that's definitely going to be a concern during the case. I find it's a delicate balance between giving them pain medicine because the local doesn't always work great. The regional blocks work awesome, but when you're doing it under local, even without a regional block, it doesn't work, you know, that well with the local. But you're you're like, how much fentanyl do you want to give, and how much is that going to contribute to like them hypoventilating, building up their CO2? These are good cases to consider like Presidex and consider ketamine for. Not large doses of ketamine, but analgesic doses of the ketamine. So hyperkalemic can be seen on the EKG. You know, the sine wave pattern is like really bad. Uh, and then obviously it can lead to ventricular fibrillation, which would require ACLS protocol and uh, in, in defibrillation. But you can start to see the peak T waves at like high Ks that are more manageable. Uh, when you lose your P waves, that's when you go into some serious problems. And anything after that's like, like, you know, we're probably canceling a case when you're over five. It's a, it all depends on what your threshold is, but probably canceling a case when you're above five point something. I mean, everyone's a little bit different. If you are a little bit higher and you still want to do the case, what would you guys do to treat that? Yep, followed by what? Yep, D50, IV insulin, D50. 
Um, you can give calcium chloride, which is a vesicant, so you'll be really careful why. It, it better be the IV you put in you're confident with and not like a small IV in the hand, the wrist, or the AC. It should be a really nice IV, uh, so maybe the forearm, like less chance that it gets mis misplaced or pulls out. Anything that's a beta-2 agonism can actually decrease insulin. Uh, as far as how much it decreases, I don't remember the numbers and stuff, but technically a buterol can do that. Lasix is another thing. You can, you can pee out the potassium. It's going to take longer. But in the acute period, the uh, 10 units of insulin with a stick of D50 is probably the easiest thing to do. Hyperventilating the patient is also a nice thing to do, too. After you get, a hyper, after you get acidotic from drop in your clamp. I also put people on like a higher ventilation setting. So I was running my like uh, end tidal CO2 like 29 on the aortic bi or the aortic aneurysm repair because I know my PA CO2 is going to be like three to five points higher. And then when we were running the ABGs actually the CO2 was like almost 10 points higher. And why do you think that is? This is why you should be doing ABGs and not like just oh they're whatever. You know it's like well we should serial ABGs is really important. It was all. It was like nine. I think nine points higher from the PaCO2 to the P P. What is that? The CO2 ETCO2 to PaCO2. That's what I'm thinking. So nine point different. It's always higher in the body than outside the body because that's the concentration gradient. It would have to go to be able to leave, which is what you want. So the reason was um, there's a gradient because you've probably got some type of shunting. There's some type of mix max or ventilation perfusion. So do you think that there was an AA gradient too? Definitely AA gradient. If you've got a gradient between CO2, you definitely, you know, CO2 being 20, 25 times more soluble and diffusible than O2, if that's not getting perfectly across, then you know there's definitely a gradient with the uh, with uh, P big A and P little a O2, which there was. So, you know, day of chem seven is a good idea. These are things we already talked about too with what questions to ask. All right, carotid endorectomy is the last thing on here. Does anybody want another ice cream bar? No? You guys are, I'm sure one of you wants one. It's all right. No judging. All right, so carotid endorectomy are also, I think, fun cases too. I mean, these are people at high risk for stroke or have already had TIA symptoms and they're hospitalized and stuff. So they have like, they mostly you got to figure out which sides they're worse on. If they have disease on one side, they'd most likely have disease on the other side. And so then your next question is, is like, if we're going to go in and fix the carotid, surgery being the best treatment possible, anything, you know, intervention wise, endovascular isn't as effective, or doesn't have as good of outcomes uh, as of right now. So, you know, we have to go to, we have to do surgery. And in order to like, fix the atherosclerotic areas, to stent it, do whatever they have to do, we're going to have to stop the blood flow. So you're going to go from having four vessels to perfuse your circle willis to three. So is do you have good collateral in these patients and stuff? So you have to assess what their flow is on both sides. So their, their non-operative carotid might need to also have its own. But when we say carotid endorectomy, CAE, it's a little short version of it. But you got to hope that that's going to work. And then what are the other two arteries that I didn't mention yet that that also supply a circle of Willis? You got to hope the circle of Willis is not that doesn't have vascular problems as well, and that that's going to perfuse their whole brain. Vertebral. vertebral arteries, yeah. There's two vertebral arteries. So it's a big question, and this is what you have to be prepared for: is that it doesn't supply enough collateral circulation, and if it doesn't, they have neurological symptoms, and they have to bypass where they're operating with um, blood so that you can go around where they're operating and still supply the bad carotid, the carotid that's the operative carotid for that day and stuff. And this can all happen. And then also, you know, during the case, plaque can be ruptured and embolized to the brain as well. So even when you think your circulation is adequate and the, re and the collateral is adequate, they could just embolize and everything you did right doesn't matter because they, they threw a clot and they could have a stroke from that as well. So there's a lot of risks involved. And then, you know, you're on the neck and you're on a, a major artery. Let's say it's like, you know, on the common carotid artery, uh, artery before it branches into the, into the internal and external carotids. Like there's a lot of blood going through there. And so what if afterwards you you're going to excavate the patient and they cough and buck and that ruptures the new site that the anastomotic area that they close 
ruptures? Or what if you're in pack, you give a report and they buck and cough or whatever and it ruptures? What if it just ruptures because you didn't manage your blood pressure well afterwards? Um, now you go from, hey, you might have a stroke to like, hey, you're about to lose your airway and you're going to compress your airway and not breathe. You know, so there's a lot of different caveats to keep in mind with these surgeries and stuff that, you know, if it goes well, it grows great and, you know, people live their lives happily, but they could also have complications before, during, and after, which you can either be directly like iatrogenically contributing to, or sometimes they're just things you just can't avoid. So people similar across men and female, all the same symptoms or the past medical conditions that contribute to having this are the same things that contribute to having the aneurysms and the thoracic, the abdominal area, and, and so on. So you see a lot of the same patterns here. So you can do this awake or you can do this under general. And what degree of general is questionable. So awake seems to be probably the better of the two. The problem is the patients typically don't tolerate it. They're anxious, they're concerned about what you're doing. They get like freaked out in the middle or in the middle of the case, they have the complication of they stroke out in the middle of the case. And now you have to intubate them because you don't have an airway anymore. So there's, there's concerns on both sides, but when you're awake, you're able to actually control their blood pressures better because you don't have to over sedate them. Like they need to be able to talk to you and you need to be able to have them follow commands. So you know, they're not having a stroke. And so that's basically your neurological monitoring is just talking to the person or you have them squeak a toy every so often. So you just tell them, and it's annoying, but you have a squeaky toy and you just say, keep squeaking the toy. The minute they stop squeaking the toy, if you're not talking to them, you're like, hey, Joe, you know, oh yeah, sorry, squeaking the toy. And you're like, all right, good. But I've had this happen where like they clamp the carotid and they they go completely unresponsive. And so again, that, that means that their collateral is not enough. So they unclamp the carotid and, or they do the bypass right there and then and get them back by having bypass around the bad carotid. And then they hopefully wake right back up and start talking again, which they did, luckily. You know, and it's kind of like, you don't tell them that, but you're like, oh, like, that's scary, you know. Um, awake too is shorter because you're not intubating and extubating and then like, you know, messing around with pressure issues. Like, it's just straightforward, a little bit of local preferably like a superficial cervical block makes more sense than deep and that's just that's easy it's you can landmark it or you can do it under ultrasound it's always better to do things under ultrasound but again superficial block local by the surgeon a little bit of like sedation maybe it's a little mixture of presidex maybe you're comfortable with doing a little bit of versed a little bit of fentanyl maybe like micro doses of ketamine you got to just feel out what works best for you and the patient and stuff you just can't have them be sedated to the point where they can't follow commands or they're confused you, they have to be able to be communicative with you general obviously you know you go to sleep and it's all up to you then to hemodynamically control them. And then you have to find another way to neuromonitor them because they can't tell you anything anymore. So other forms of monitoring, uh, stump pressure is basically, I'll draw it on the board. Here's my common carotid, let's do right common carotids. Oh yeah, here. Let's do right common carotids so it comes off the aorta. Or no, that's left. I wrote this wrong, guys. No one said anything. That's left. Remember, the right comes off of here. Comes off the another one here. Um, right. So let's do, I, let's just say it's right. So that's the right. It's coming up off the board right here. And let's say this is like your like disease atherosclerosis right here, causing like 80% stenosis, which is really significant, a lot more risk factors. And it goes back up. Let's say it branches, you know, internal, external right there. Um, so you have a stenotic area right here. And when the surgeon wants to put a clamp on, they clamp it here because this is where the heart is. So they clamp here and what they can do is, is they can, um, they got to clamp on both sides. They don't want blood coming out from uh, retrograde flow. Um, so what happens is they can put a catheter into the stump right here. And then they'll hand they'll hand you or you're gonna hand them a sterile oh, they're gonna hand you a sterile transducer and you're gonna just like for an A-line, you're gonna monitor this in millimeters of mercury. And that's measuring, hopefully, this is your internal carotid, it goes up. This is your other internal carotid, and this is your circle of willis right here, right? This is your all your blood flow. Vertebrals are right here and right here. 
So hopefully it gives you an indirect measurement of what your mean arterial pressure, mean perfusing pressure is looking up to your circle of Willis. Most people say it should be over 50, but obviously this comes from some book. I don't know where I got this number from. It's from when I did this lecture a couple years ago, but this is saying it should be greater than 30 to 50. It's one way of assessing if you're perfusing enough through collateral circulation. A lot of times the stump pressure is gonna be done at the same time as EEG waveform monitoring is gonna do. Awake we talked about, transcranial Doppler is another technique. It's looking at velocity in the middle cerebral artery, which happens to come off the internal carotid. So you look at the middle cerebral artery coming off the side that you're doing surgery on. The problem with it is it tells you velocity. So if there's like changes in Pascal's law, the velocity is gonna change if there's underlying pathological disease, right? Constrictions or vasodilations. But is it telling you enough blood flow and oxygen uh, de delivery? Not really. So hit or miss if it's a good thing to use or not. There's limitations to it. It does give you an idea about embolizations though. So for embolizations, it's good for using. I don't think anyone in anesthesia does it. I think it has to have a technician. So now you're adding more people to the room in order to do transcranial Doppler monitoring. Cerebral oximetry is something that we would be able to do and monitor. The neuro ICU people use it. Um, it's monitoring, it's monitoring uh, perfusion of the frontal cortex. So what you basically look for is a drop in the SAT. If the SAT drops more than 20% after you clamp, you can suspect that you don't have enough uh, collateral blood flow. Shunting is what we talked about. It's when we have problems, we shunt. Some surgeons shunt always. Others only shunt if necessary. So if your pressure is less than 30 to 50, so for lecture purposes, because it's re-recording on the slide, squeaky toy if you're awake, and then talking to the patient. So you can have complications. So for the test, you just need to have an idea of like what, the, how you're gonna present symptom-wise with these neurological complications. The neurological complications are usually a result either from directly traumatizing the nerve in the area where they're operating or it's from retracting. They obviously need someone or something to hold the skin back and the muscle layers back. And as a result, you can have compression injuries to the nerves as well. Um, so, or it could be perfusing to the nerves. I mean, it could be anything, right? If you go back to the, the positioning lecture from last semester. So the, the most common, I think, is like damage to, I think it's damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the vagus nerve in general. And then the next most common is the hypoglossal. But basically, if you have a, if you think of like hypoglossal, like that's a cranial nerve, it's what makes you stick your tongue out. So if you, at the end of these cases, you do want to do a neuro exam and the surgeon should be doing it really too. It's their case, but you do want to be able to assess this patient because the surgeon might leave, go home, and you're the one, if you're in a small facility covering PACU or if, you are, if you're on a PACU experience, this is a great time to do like your cranial nerve assessments and just in general, like asking the patient, you know, stick your tongue out. It, you're going to deviate towards the injury uh, if, they're, if they do have a deficit and they can't stick it straight out. So that's hypoglossal. Um, let's see, it, we know recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries from we talked about the media stenoscopies. That's going to be hoarseness afterwards. The true danger is, is if they had hoarseness to begin with and no one appreciated that they already had a, uh, an injury to like a recurrent laryngeal nerve on one side, and then you go and injure the other side. So when you extubate these patients, there's always that risk that like you had an unknown injury to one side, you damaged the side on the side of surgery, and now they can completely close their airway and you might have an airway emergency when you go to extubate the patient. Because the tube's in and you're able to breathe through the tube and they're awake, but when you pull the tube, they may not be able to breathe through their airway anymore and that's gonna be, become a problem. I don't know, well, I guess what you'd ask is like, have you had any recent in history of hoarseness or anything like that. And then the question would be is like, okay, well, what do we do? I am next week gonna bring in the ultrasound, which is that case I brought in like for four weeks and we never had time to play with it. But I'll show you on there, you can probably get an image of the vocal cords and you can have them phonate ahead of time and see both vocal cords moving. It's a point of care ultrasound test. It's like takes a couple seconds. Um, have I seen anyone ever do it? No, but the more you learn, the more you're able to do as a provider. Facial nerve. So what do you think happens with the facial nerve? That's how you grimace, right? So you have to ask them to grimace. And if you see one side doesn't grimace, facial nerve has an injury. 
Accessory nerve, I didn't find more things talking about the accessory nerve, so I don't know if that's going to be something we have to assess, but what do you think the accessory nerve does? Anybody? Anyone? Someone want to look it up? Accessory nerve. So these are things you're going to see afterwards. You're not going to be able to assess these during the case. Yeah. So you put your hands on their shoulders and you say push up, you know, and if one side pushes up, the other doesn't. That's how you would know. And the facial nerve is like you'll see a drooped eyelid, but, you know, yeah, drooped eyelid is it, there's like five branches off the facial nerve. So the one that I'm not going to tell you the one that it is. I'll tell you, but you don't even know the exact one. It's um, the mandibular branch. But just you know, eyelid droop. Or if you saw a picture where like you know one side of their face is not grimacing, it's you know it's gonna be as simple as that. And the glossopharyngeal nerve is the actual nerve that innervates the glossopharyng the uh, carotid sinus. So if they mess with that nerve at all, you might see hemodynamic changes, bradycardia, and so on. So you absolutely, during the preoperative assessment, need to know everything about their baseline, especially because they may have already had multiple TIAs, or they could have stroked and have residual deficits before going back for the surgery. And it's thought that this is going to be important to do this case, regardless of the increased risk factors for having further deficits from complications. If they're working on the left side, you put the tube on the right side. It just keeps things away from the field and away from the surgeon so that they can operate without actually you know, taking the tube out. These patients are typically um, away from you and in like a bad position to be able to intubate them. So if you are worried about the patient or anything along those lines, you probably are better off having an endotracheal tube in versus no airway or an LMA because when there are complications, it's going to be hard to get to the patient without compromising the sterility of the field. So we can do the wake with a cervical block. The deep block is possible, but you know, you can actually like start numbing nerves that you don't want to numb and then cause issues with your airway. The two that I'm talking about most commonly are going to be your phrenic nerve and then your uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Again, they come in with hoarseness of the, of the lungs. You're operating on the right side. They're left reoccurrence down, but you didn't know that. And now you anesthetize. And one of the common complications or common side effects, I would say, of doing a deep cervical block is you can just block the right reoccurrent. It's not a big deal. And you can all, but it is if you had a left that's blocked from something else, because like a previous intubation, you guys bummed their recurrent laryngeal, or not you, the first year is dead, right? Not you guys. And then you have now complete airway occlusion, so that's a complication. Maybe it doesn't set up right away, it sets up 10 minutes later, and then you see it. The other thing is when you do block a phrenic nerve, some people with lung disease really feel short of breath. They feel weird, like they can't get their lungs to open up. I've seen this post-operatively in a lot of patients when we do normal blocks and stuff, like, you know, um, supraclavicular blocks or uh, anything really clavicular, you could possibly see it, but it's mostly like supraclavicular interscaling. Um, and then, you know, you just have to talk to them, tell them that they're fine, they're breathing and stuff. But this could be something when someone's awake, freaking out with their neck being split open, they won't tolerate it and stuff. So I think superficial is probably the better way to go. This link goes to talk about the superficial and deep cervical block. I won't ask any questions from the link because, again, you could learn it, but until you start doing it, it's going to just be a lot of extra information that's going to overload you. So just what's on the slide here. But I, the Sora is awesome. So awake, check every five to 10 minutes. But when it comes to clamp time, you check right before clamp time. And then you just keep talking to them the entire time they're on the clamp until either A, they go unconscious, or B, they revascularize and they unclamp. A lot of work from you guys to be cheerleaders for the patients. If they go unconscious, you have to secure their airway. So have everything ready to do that. Have the induction agents, have the drugs ready, the tubes and everything ready. If you can't tube them, have the LMA ready to be able to LMA them. 
The goal is actually normal capnia. It's not hypocapnia, it's not hypercapnia. If you're hypocapnic, you vasoconstrict, which means you decrease flow. If you're hypercapnic, which is what some people thought would be good, you vasodilate, so you increase flow because you want to get lots of oxygen there. You don't care about the pressure, you want lots of oxygen. You care about the pressure to a degree if you're going uphill, obviously. But generally speaking, the hypercapnia has been shown to cause steel syndrome. So yeah, the blood goes, more blood flow goes to all the great areas of the lungs, but you're pressure dependent in the areas that aren't well perfused. So you might actually cause further ischemia by being hypercapnic. So normal capnia. When you're dissecting, when the surgeon's dissecting down, that can cause embolization. So if they're awake, you'll see them go unresponsive. They might start to slur, they don't seem right. As you're dissecting down, there is the carotid uh, sinus that's there that's innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. I think that's a test question. And so you can actually, as you're manipulating it, you can either cause increased sympathetic response, but more than likely your concern is actually bradycardia. And the bradycardia can be profound. So some people pre-treat with, um, never ending with these phone calls. Some people will pre-treat with glyco, 0.2 to 0.4, and then others will have atropine ready if necessary. The other thing that can work, and I've seen it done, is the surgeon will have, and you can ask, like you have local on the field for the for if they get bradycardic, is they can inject around the, once they identify where the um, carotid sinus is, they can inject local around there and anesthetize it so it doesn't keep sending action potentials to the brain to become bradycardic. When it's time to when it's time to cross clamp, you know you gotta heparinize. So you're thinking ACT is over 200 to 250. Once you're clamped and you don't have a bypass, you want to go higher than normal. That's all surgeon specific, and you should have that conversation with them as you're doing it and stuff. What that number is. One of the answers I found in the books is like 20% over baseline. But I've seen also in clinical practice people putting up into like the 180s, 190s for systolics just to perfuse well. But we know though that as you increase your afterload, you're dropping, you're probably dropping some of your stroke volume and cardiac output depending on how well the heart can contract against those higher pressures. So is that helping with flow or not? I don't know. Um, but people typically will increase the blood pressure quite significantly. When you're ready to unclamp, your biggest your biggest concern then is then blowing the graft. High uncontrolled high blood pressure will blow the graft. Um, it can also contribute to cerebral edema because you might have fixed the flow restriction in the in the actual carotid, but at the same time though, you haven't fixed the chronic vasodilatory changes in the brain. So you can have reperfusion injuries in the brain. So blood, pr blood pressure control is absolutely necessary. If it goes too low, you can clot off your, your, new, your new site, your new uh, carotid. So it's a very delicate management. 100 to 150, I think it's a pretty good estimate, but this is a conversation you have with the surgeon, find out what they want for this procedure. This is the same time you're gonna know you're dosing for esmol, nitroglycerin, and narcotipine, as well as labetalol. You can probably give like five to 10 milligrams of labetalol is a pretty common dose. It works, you know, pretty reasonably quick. Um, I don't think it's as fast as esmol, nitro, or narcotipine, but it's not a bad drug that's gonna help you more long-term in the PACU. Hydralazine takes 20 minutes for peak effect, so it's not a good drug. You can give it with the anticipation the pressure is gonna be high if you think it's appropriate, but it's not a good drug for emergence. If you give protamine, not always, you run the risk of, of uh, decreasing the risk of you know, hemorrhaging, but also increasing the risk of clotting, and then obviously the anaphylaxis that's associated with, with protamine as well. Not everyone reverses. When you're emerging, you absolutely need to make sure that they don't buck and cough. So is this patient, based on your area exam, a good patient to do a deep extubation on? Ask yourself that. When I consider deep extubations, I consider that to be like a full MAC of gas or a full deep anesthetic. I don't want to see when you touch the tube that the patient hopefully doesn't buck. Like if you don't have enough gas on it, they don't, when you, because when you take that tube out, you're moving the tube. So if you touch that tube ahead of time, 
God forbid they buck, you don't want that. You want to have enough narcotics on board that are short acting, that it helps with the emergence, but not messing with your neuro exam. The neuro exam is absolutely not necessary. You need to be clearly awake and talking and moving and showing your grimacing and your shoulders and all that when you excavate in the room, ideally, because if not, you're going to go back to sleep and stuff. So you don't want, you don't want Dilaudid, you don't want morphine, you know, you got to be careful what you get for fentanyl. So in these cases, people will do like Remy drips and stuff, lower the dose to like 0.05 or less. Uh, mice per kilogram per minute just to get them to wake up on the remming and be really calm so but that's if you're waking up if you're going to be doing it deep i would pretty much have them fully anesthetized mess with the tube back breathing and if they don't breath hold or stack the respirations and stuff and look you know uneven with the respiratory rate and they don't get tachycardic from it it's probably a good time to pull the tube make sure the airway is completely dry afterwards and then i usually will pull the tube and put an oral airway in so we eliminate the chance for obstruction so that we can get the um, mass back on make sure they're breathing i usually like to also close the pop off after because the next thing we do if they were obstructing or spasming is turn the pop off and close it and give them pressure so i give them a little bit of pressure make them breathe across that pressure and then hopefully they're moving and tidal and i know they're breathing and at that point i turn my gas up turn my flows up and i just wait in the room until they wake up same thing with peas except for peas we leave them asleep go to the back you but here we stay in the room if you wake them up you got to be really smooth. So maybe consider giving lidocaine at the end in order to help with that blunting of the airway reflexes, um, or just consider having, you know, some type of narcotic on board that's, you know, again, really your only chances are fentanyl. So you got to be really careful what you give. I forget the technique, but someone had a technique that I've never met that I've seen online that what they do is, is they actually take the tube out while you're deep and you put an LMA in afterwards. So now you're traumatizing the airway twice, but we all know people with LMAs wake up way smoother, less reactive airways to like LMAs, perfect for people with smoking histories or COPD. LMA is better than a tube, but not as good as MAC, right? So you can do the LMA if you want to ventilate them until they wake up and then just pull the LMA. Be careful if you're trying to pull people's tubes when they're not awake, but they're not fully deep, you can run into some serious problems. There's no literature that supports it. It's sort of like cowboy land. Airway managements, you pull the tube, the patient wakes up and talks to you, and then when you go into PACU, you look at the patient, because you're pushing the bed from behind, and they have a massive hematoma on their neck, and they're striderous. The hematoma can, can push the uh, trachea and deviate all the way over. So now it's an absolute emergency. You have to get the surgeon back and go right back in the room, and you have to re-explore that, that hematoma. Some will say you should just cut the suture lines if you have a hematoma and let all the blood out and let it just exsanguate as you get your airway back in. Be prepared for an airway that doesn't look normal, it's deviated, it's going to be hard to find. And it, because of the trauma of the intubation and extubation, which is just normal trauma, your second time in, it might not look anything like it used to. It might go from a grade one to a grade four really quickly. So I would be like calling for help, a glide scope, and then a fiber optic scope to get that in. Um, you know, again, how will an LMA see on an airway that's moved, deviated over several centimeters? I don't know the answer to that. So you can't rely on the LMA working either. So just be prepared for, you know, God knows what. And then as you're swelling over, I mean, in that blood under pressure is pushing into like, and this is from not good blood pressure control, you may not feel for the cricoid thyroid membrane either because now that's got blood in the under the skin, under the epidermis, his blood is kind of extenuating to all the layers. So then if you go to crike that person, that might also be hard too. Um, so these are just emergencies and it's, it's usually from poor blood pressure management. Hyperperfusion syndrome is what I was talking about before. So poor blood pressure management, you can develop this actually over the course of one to two weeks post-operatively. And this basically comes down to what I said before, which is you've, you've now have great flow through the carotid on the side that you operated on, but now di proximal or distal, I guess, if you're thinking from the heart going to the brain, so distal in the brain, the, the vessels in the cerebral parts of the brain have chronically vasodilated over time to try and accommodate the uh, drop in the actual uh, blood volume. And so now you've, you're putting high pressure in a semi-dilated um, uh, vasculature, and then it, it's going to cause it to leak and cause edema into the actual interstitium. And so it can either leak and cause edema or it can actually cause uh, hemorrhaging into the interstitium and stuff, and then people can present with strokes. One to three percent, and there's varying degrees of this, 
So uh, seizures are probably your biggest enemy, um, and that's something you got to get them on anti-seizure medicines, so like Dilantin and Keppra. You should CAT scan them if you have a concern of this happening and stuff. People who are at risk are the ones that start off with like no flow in the carotid. So obviously when you fix the flow from 80% or greater to like no percent, they're gonna be at higher risk because their vessels, everything distal in the capillaries aren't used to that uh, pressure and flow.